Up next in the broadcast, President Bakane and U.S. President Barack Obama hold talks on the sidelines of the APEC summit in Beijing, which the Blue House spokesperson describes as useful for both sides. Also at the top level meeting, APEC leaders agree on setting a roadmap for a China backed move to establish a regional free trade bloc. And the captain of the sunken Selho ferry receives his sentencing 36 years behind bars for abandoning ship at the time of the deadly sinking. Primetime News begins now. Welcome to Primetime News, coming to you live from Seoul. I am Kang Tae. And I'm Sean Lim. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. We begin in Beijing, where President Bakane and U.S. President Barack Obama held summit talks on the sidelines of the APEC summit on this Tuesday. Korea's presidential office says the two leaders agreed that the international community's concerted position is very important in addressing the North Korean nuclear issue. Presidents Park and Obama then agreed to continue their joint efforts to denuclearize North Korea. They also talked about the need to cooperate with Japan on the this matter. Seoul's peace and unification initiatives were also discussed in the meeting. On the Ebola outbreak, President Park spoke highly of her American counterpart's leadership, to which President Obama thanked Seoul for its support behind the international campaign to contain the virus. One of the main points of conversation at this year's APEC summit in Beijing has been China's vision for a regional trade bloc called the Free Trade Area of the Asia Pacific. On this Tuesday, President Park Geun-hye pledged Korea's full support, and Chinese President Xi Jinping announced the official beginning of the FTA AP roadmap. Our Kwon Suwa tells us more. President Park Geun-hye's endorsement of the China-backed trade pact came after her Chinese counterpart called on APEC leaders to actively work to realize the free trade area of the Asia-Pacific. If and when in effect, it would become one of the largest FTAs covering more than half of the global economy and trade. President Xi Jinping announced the FTAAP's blueprint as ready on the conclusion of the APEC summit Tuesday after last week's minister-level talks. We decided to launch the FTAAP process. It represents a historic step we've made towards the realization of the FTAAP and marks the official launch of the process. At this point, this launch means nothing more than a strategic study to take around two years. But it's widely expected to bring much attention to the G2 nation's competition in building their trade blocks. The focus now goes to how and whether this step will have an impact on the U.S.-led multilateral free trade framework called the TPP, short for Trans-Pacific Partnership, which China is not a part of. In case of South Korea, President Park has also reportedly expressed her country's interest in joining the U.S.-led TPP early this year. Kwon Suwa, Arirang News. Staying with the trade theme, following the announcement of the Korea-China Free Trade Agreement on this Monday, uh, Korea's service industries are gearing up uh, to seize the moment, and local banks are also getting ready for more yuan-based transactions. Our Song ji has this report. Korea's service industries that will gain access to China's 1.4 billion consumers range from travel and leisure to finance and distribution sectors. The free trade deal also allows Korean law firms to set up joint ventures with their Chinese counterparts in Shanghai's free trade zone, while Korean entertainment companies can hold stakes of up to 49 percent of Chinese entities. Beijing, which has pledged to ease regulations to allow Korean participation in building up China's public telecommunications networks, will explore ways to expand service sector cooperation between the two nations. 
we will have more opportunities to gain greater access to the service sector as follow-up negotiations will take place over the next two years after the free trade deal takes effect. Korean banks are also preparing for the increased need to settle bilateral trade in their own currencies. Seoul and Beijing have earlier agreed to open a direct U.N. trading market in the Korean capital next month. The Chinese currency now accounts for a mere 1.2 percent of payments made to settle two-way trade that totaled $228 billion last year. The Korean government's goal is to raise that portion of yuan-based settlement to 20 percent next year. In the coming month, local banks will also launch savings plans in the Chinese yuan with an annual interest rate of 3 percent, nearly double the interest paid for local currency-based savings accounts. Song ji -sun. Arirang News. Korea's reliance on China for growth is only expected to grow with their recently agreed upon bilateral free trade agreement. This is especially true for the nation's top 200 companies, which are already very active in China. Between 2011 and 2013, their combined sales there jumped 35 percent to more than 133 billion U.S. dollars. Samsung Electronics seems to have benefited the most from Korea's blossoming trade relationship with China. The firm's sales spiked to $36.6 billion in 2013, which is up 74 percent from 2011. Experts say Korean exporters need to focus more on premium, high-tech products and consumer goods to better tap into China's domestic market rather than depending too much on intermediate goods. And the foreign fan base for Korean products continues to grow. It first started with clothes, then shifted to cosmetics, and now it's spreading to food. Our Shin Semin reports on why more overseas consumers are clicking the mouse to buy Korean goods online. November 11th is celebrated as Pepero Day in Korea as the Pepero snack resembles the ones in the date. Used as a marketing tool by the manufacturer Lotte Confectionery, the sales of the Pepero sticks fly off the shelves once early November rolls around each year and the popularity has expanded to other countries. According to online retail shopping mall G Market, sales of Pepero have chopped the list of processed food products over the past month in its global shop. But the growth expands far beyond Pepero. Last month, the total sales of Korean processed food surged over 160 percent on month. The G Market Global Shop, which reported a 57 percent sales jump in the first 10 months of this year, offers food items ranging from chocolate and instant noodles to seasoned labor, red chili paste, and even fermented seafood. I regularly purchase salt fermented seafood online. It was a little difficult to get my hands on it, but now it only takes three to five days to get when I buy it online. Online retail shopping malls are boosting services to accelerate the market. Maltail, a direct purchasing website, recently partnered up with the Korea Postal Service, making shipping easier for a number of products, even fresh produce. Considering that the majority of the shopping exports are being made to China and the level of their spending on Korean products, whether it be cosmetics or pepero, the sales will most likely surge. If their interest in Korean food products continues, it will definitely influence Korea's food industry. And since Korea and China have concluded FTA negotiations on a deal that will remove tariffs on most products, more Chinese customers are expected to log into Korean online retailers to fill up their shopping carts. Shin Semin, Arirang News. The captain of the Seolho ferry that sank back in April has avoided the death penalty. Lee jun suk was instead sentenced to 36 years in prison, and others in his crew will also spend some time behind bars. Our Kim Yeon-bin tells us more. A district court in Gwangju on Tuesday sentenced Lee jun suk the captain of the Seolho ferry, to 36 years in prison. For abandoning ship at the time of the deadly sinking. He was, however, acquitted of murder charges, 
meaning he avoids the death penalty, which prosecutors had pushed for. The court said in their ruling that there wasn't enough evidence to convict E of murder. They said the prosecution had failed to prove that E was aware his actions would lead to the deaths of people on board. In the same ruling, the ferry's chief engineer, identified only by his family name, Pak, was convicted of murder and sentenced to 30 years in prison. He was found responsible for not helping two crew members who later died in the ferry escape. Thirteen other crew members were given sentences ranging between 5 and 20 years on charges of abandoning ship and violations of ship safety protocol. Prosecutors pinned most of the blame for the deaths of 300 plus people in the ferry disaster on Yi and his crew, as they told passengers to stay in the cabins while the crew hurriedly left the sinking ferry. Tuesday's verdicts bring the five month trial to a close. Prosecutors say they will appeal Tuesday's court decision on all 15 crew members. The ruling came hours after the Korean government ended a seven month underwater search inside the sunken Cerro Hole ferry. The 6,800 ton ferry sank on April 16th off Korea's southwestern coast. The death toll in the tragedy currently stands at 295, with nine still missing. Kim Hyun Bin, Arirang News. An official full stop to the search operations for missing victims of the Seoul Ho ferry disaster. The official announcement was made earlier today. Our Connie Kim tells us more on the government's decision made upon the request of the victims' families. The underwater search operations for missing victims of the Seoul Ho ferry disaster has come to an end, despite nine people still being unaccounted for. Oceans and Fisheries Minister Lee Ju Young announced Tuesday morning that the government made the decision upon the request of victims' families. We are announcing that the underwater search operations that continued for more than 200 days are being stopped. I sincerely regret calling off the operations without recovering all those unaccounted for. Minister Lee said that parts of the hull are collapsing and that dropping water temperatures are making operations difficult and dangerous for divers. He added there was little possibility of recovering additional victims. Measures aimed at preventing bodies from drifting out of the sunken ferry will also come to an end. The emergency management headquarters in Chindo, the closest point of land to the accident site, will scale back operations and soon dissolve. Although underwater search operations have come to an end, Victims' families are not giving up hope of finding their loved ones. They requested that the government fully review the options of raising the vessel, calling it a final means to finding the nine who remain missing. Relatives also called on the government to keep them informed throughout the process. The minister said the Central Disaster Management Headquarters will decide on when to start raising the ferry from the seafloor after discussions with experts and relatives of the victims. That decision is likely to come after this Hilda ferry law takes effect. The law aims to uncover the causes of the disaster, which left more than 300 people dead. The last victim recovered from the vessel came late last month. Before that, no one had been found inside the sunken ferry since July. Connie Kim, Arirang News. Iconic Korean singer Lee Seung Chul was denied entry into Japan this past weekend. Lee's agency says it's in retaliation for his recent concert on Korea's Tokdo Island. Korea's foreign ministry says that would be a regrettable reason, and after looking into the matter, was told that they couldn't get an answer due to privacy reasons. Our Park Ji Won has more on this story. The concert at the root of the controversy took place on Korea's Tokdo Island a day before Liberation Day in August. Lee seung was there to sing his new song that day with a choir made up of teenage North Korean defectors. Fast forward a few months, and the 47-year-old set off for a trip to Japan on November 9th. However, upon his arrival at Tokyo's Haneda Airport, the singer was detained for four hours at the airport's immigration office. Various media outlets report that when Lee was asked why he was being held, an official said it was due to recent media exposure, presumably in reference to his Tokyo concert. Lee was said to be furious about his treatment and when he threatened to expose what had happened. 
Japanese officials said his entrance had been denied based on his past use of marijuana more than 20 years ago. Despite the immigration office's claim, Lee has entered Japan more than 15 times since his arrest for marijuana use in Korea in the early 1990s. He even held a concert in Japan in the 2000s. Following the incident, Lee canceled his schedule in Japan and is now taking a break in Korea. Lee's agency says the singer believes the retaliatory denial of entrance was due to his concert on Tokdo, which Japan falsely claims to be its territory. This is not the first time that a Korean star involved in a Tokdo-related campaign has been discriminated against in Japan. Korean star Song Il-guk, who participated in a swimming project to Tokdo in 2012, was warned that he might experience problems if he tries to enter Japan, and the drama Song acted in was pulled off from the airwaves in Japan six days before it was due to premiere. Park Ji-won, Arirang News. Nearly 50 students have been killed and more than 75 others injured in a school bomb attack in Nigeria. With more, we turn to Paul Yi at the News Center. Paul, this is the second suicide bombing to hit the country in less than a week and comes as the government there is under fire for failing to contain Boko Haram's terror spree. Well, it marks the seventh deadly attack this year on a school in the country. Police say the attacker, disguised as a student, set off the explosion, which tore through a school in the northeastern town of Poritsku. At least 48 people were killed, all believed to be between the ages of 11 and 20. In a statement, UN Chief Ban Ki moon strongly condemned the violence and called for those responsible to be brought to justice. The Secretary General is outraged by the frequency and brutality of attacks against educational institutions in the north of the country and reiterates his demand for an immediate cessation to these abominable crimes. Although no group has claimed responsibility for the attack, Boko Haram militants are suspected. Their violent insurgency over the past five years has left thousands of civilians dead in Nigeria. And turning now to the United States, police in New York have announced they will stop arresting people for possession of small amounts of marijuana starting on November 19th. Police Commissioner Bill Branton announced Monday that officers will instead give tickets or a summons to those caught with small amounts of the drug. New York City Mayor Bill de Lagio welcomed the move and said it would help young people and minorities. Too many New Yorkers without any prior convictions have been arrested for low-level marijuana possession. Black and Latino communities have been disproportionately affected. There have been, in some cases, disastrous consequences for individuals and families. And our intention is to help all New Yorkers, particularly get our young people on the right track, and avoid these unnecessary consequences. The NYPD says it's still strongly against the legalization of marijuana, but hopes the change in policy will reduce unnecessary arrests. NYPD detained over 20,000 people last year alone for low-level marijuana crimes. And shifting back to Asia, China's online retail giant Alibaba has reported more than 2 billion U.S. dollars in sales in just the first hour on the Singles Day today. Alibaba founder and CEO Jack Ma said Tuesday that nationwide sales had already hit $4.9 billion by noon, with mobile transactions accounting for nearly half of the purchases. The massive shopping event comes on the heels of the company's latest earnings call, which showed nearly a 54 percent increase in revenue on year. The percentage of mobile transactions is a percentage of the overall ecosystem relative to a lot of the global peers that are out there, whether it be Amazon or, or eBay. Or, you don't really see the, the mobile penetration rates that, uh, that, uh, that Molly Bob is putting up anywhere else uh, in, in the global e-commerce e landscape. Singles Day, celebrated on November 11th, has now become the world's largest online shopping day, with sales expected to easily surpass last year's record of $5.8 billion. And finally, India's top court has ended a nationwide ban on women being able to work as makeup artists in the Bollywood industry. Trade unions said the ban, which lasted for six decades, was to ensure men were not deprived of work. That justification was ruled as discriminatory by India's Supreme Court on Monday. 
Charo Karana, who first brought up the case, said it was a victory to all working women in the industry. I am very happy and satisfied because now all the women who want to be makeup artists will have job opportunities and can present their work with their name, which will bring them recognition. India's two billion U.S. dollar film industry is the largest in the world by ticket sales, and according to trade analysts, the Hindi language industry alone employs more than 250,000 people. And that wraps up our look at international stories for now. I'll see you back here tomorrow night. Hello and welcome, I'm Stephen Che with a look at sports. First up, Game 6 of the KBO Korean Series between the Samsung Lions and Nexon Heroes. The Lions to Game 5 in dramatic fashion to take the 3-2 series lead. And one win away from the 4 peat Samsung had the Game 2 winner Yoon Sung Hwan on the mound. Nexon had Oh Jae Young who did well in Game 3. And to the third inning, Samsung bases loaded Che Tae-in singles. And after that, Che Hyung Woo doubles, four runs score. Now we go to the next frame. Nexon's Itek Good hits home Sogon Chang to make it 4 to 1. But sixth inning with two men on, Yamiko Navarro slams the long ball, a record tying fourth of the series. And more runs tack on in the seventh and the ninth. And the bowl plan closes it out. Samsung goes on to beat Nexon 11 to 1 as Yoon Sung Hwan gets his second finals win. They take home their fourth straight title and are your 2014 KBO Korean Series champions. And over to the KBL. Just one ball game on the night in Jeonju. The KCC Aegis hosted the LG Sakers. And the Sakers see an early 14-point lead squander away by the third quarter. But thanks to Chris Massey, who gets a massive double 20, they pick up the pieces late to get the win away from home. And moving on, the V League kicked off round two action in Daejeon. First, let's get to the Korea Jensen Corporation taking on the Hyundai ENC Hill State. The home team gives Hyundai ENC a tough time in the first set, but the visitors eventually take it along with the next two in the straight sets victory. And to the men, the Samsung Hwaje Blue Fangs and Kepco Vic Storm split the first two, but Leo and the Blue Fangs rally to take it three sets to one. And looking overseas to the ATP World Tour Finals in London, world number one Novak Djokovic and Swiss star Stan Wawrinka cruise past their first opponents with ease. First up, Djokovic, the two-time defending champ, swept past Marin Jilic 6-1, 6-1 to extend his indoor winning streak to 27 matches. Meanwhile, Australian Open champion Stan Wawrinka, he crushed Thomas Burdich by the same score in the earlier match. Now the round robin, or rather, the round robin group match play continues until Friday. And finally, Real Madrid superstar Cristiano Ronaldo is going to need more space on his mantle after adding two trophies to his ballooning collection. He won Marcus Pichichi Trophy as La Liga's top goal scorer last season with 31 strikes, as well as a third straight Alfredo Di Stefano Trophy awarded to the Spanish league's best player. And meanwhile, Son Heung-min earned a spot in the Champions League Match Day 4 Team of the Week, having scored twice in Leverkusen's 2-1 win over Zenit in group stage competition. And that wraps it up for me. Stay tuned for your weather up next. Have a great night. Good evening, I'm Kim bo Kyung with your weather forecast. Earlier today, fine dust rose to higher than normal levels but has since cleared out. And at the moment, we are under cloudy skies and more clouds are moving in which will lead to showers in parts of Gyeonggi-do province. As for tomorrow, about 5 millimeters of rain is forecast nationwide which may be accompanied by stormy conditions and strong winds in the central regions. Also, there is a possibility of snowfall on the mountains of Gyeonggi-do province as well as Jeju. Looking ahead, Thursday is college entrance
Chinese exam day here in Korea, and it looks like tomorrow's showers will pull down Thursday's morning lows to below zero. On to tomorrow's readings. Seoul peaks at 10, while Daegu and Gwangju hit the mid teens. As for other regions, Daejeon reaches 11, Jeju 16, Tokyo makes it to 15. Those are the updates we're following at this hour. I'll see you soon. And that's primetime news for this Tuesday. Thanks for watching. I'm Sean Lim. And I'm Kang Tae We'll see you again soon. Have a great night.